So now that I've given you an overview of patterns, it's time that we can start diving into the details of each of the patterns we're going to make the focus of the course. So the first pattern we're going to talk about is the composite pattern. And I'm going to talk about how you can use this pattern to make the structure of the expression tree more uniform and extensible. And that's really the name of the game in software. If you, if you do a good job and you structure your software design and architecture properly, as requirements change, as your platform changes, as new opportunities arise to get new customers, you have a heck of a lot less rework required in order to accommodate those requirements and environments than otherwise would be the case. So as I mentioned, we're gonna use this pattern to structure the expression tree, and it's gonna make it easy in particular to add new types of nodes, as well as new node operations. And if we didn't use this pattern, as we will see later, it would be very complicated to do all this kind of stuff because you basically design yourself into a corner, as we sometimes like to say. So when we talked earlier, when I was going over what the expression tree was kind of at a high level, I talked about the fact that we wanted to do domain analysis. And domain analysis is just a fancy way for saying, figure out the problem space in which you're working, identify the key roles and responsibilities in that problem space, and then make sure that your software design mimics or mirrors that physical world appropriately. Now, in this case, it's, it's really a, still a virtual world because it's the world of software design. But if you think of a tree as a, as a real thing, we want to make sure that the software design mimics the physical structure of our tree. So here is our physical tree. It's a, still a virtual tree, of course, but hopefully you get the point. This is a tangible representation of the tree. And you can see here that this tree has certain kinds of elements in it. It's got leaf nodes that have no children, unary nodes that have one child, and binary nodes that have multiple children, or two children in particular. And we want our software design to mimic that representation, that way of looking at the domain of expression trees. Moreover, we want to be able to add new operations on our tree without having to change anything about our design, without having to change anything with our implementation. Now, of course, the new operations will have to be defined afresh, but we don't want to have to change the interfaces. We don't have to change the code we've already written. And that's the holy grail of good software design, to be able to make changes, add new capability without perturbing anything that's already there or perturbing it in the most minor imaginable way. So let's take a look at some of the examples of things we want to be able to do. We want to be able to print the nodes of the tree. We want to be able to evaluate the yield of the nodes of the tree to come up with a result like this tree has the value or the yield minus 35. We might want to do other kinds of things like do some kind of semantic analysis, some kind of optimization. Maybe we do some kind of a, uh, a mechanism that will allow us to generate code for different backends, and so on and so forth. And when we talk about the visitor pattern, you'll see how we can do these kinds of things transparently because we're going to apply this pattern called composite to do the structural parts in a very uniform and canonical way. Now, what's, what's the anti-pattern? What do we not want to do? What we don't want to do is we don't want to tightly couple the data structure and functionality of our expression tree design in a way where any changes break all kinds of stuff or require considerable surgery to existing code and to existing design. So we will talk more about this later, but there's another part of the course after I get through some of these patterns where we actually talk about the algorithmic decomposition of this expression tree processing app. And I show you a little snippet of it here, but this is what you do not want to do. You do not want to have a situation where you're having people write code that couples all the different things, doesn't couple the different kinds of nodes, doesn't couple the, the notion of an edge versus a node and all those kinds of things. And this, this classic algorithmic decomposition anti-pattern is the, the counter example to good design, as we'll see in more detail when we get a little further along. And as we'll see, this is going to be a major limitation. Algorithmic decomposition tends to design and program you into a corner it's like painting yourself into a corner, which leads to bad results in terms of extensibility and reuse. In particular, and like I said, we'll talk about this in more detail. If I wanted to change my 
algorithmic design to support yet another kind of node, like a ternary node, that would require changing what I already have to add a bunch more stuff. And anytime you go and change your program, especially central data structures like tree node, this will ripple through everything else. And you'll have to go and make a lot of modifications to other source files. You'll have to go through and rerun a lot of tests, write a lot of new tests. It just gets very, very convoluted very quickly. And uh, that, that we typically think about that as making software sustainment and evolution unnecessarily convoluted and expensive. It, it increases total ownership costs. Now, obviously, when we're doing programs for CS251, the whole concept of total ownership cost is probably a little bit foreign to you because the only thing you're doing here is making life more complicated when you write your program. But be aware that as you go through life and you work on systems that live longer than a month, which is what ours are going to do, that this leads to what's called technical debt. And if you make a lot of bad decisions up front, then over time, you pay the price of them as you move into further stages of your program. I try to give you a taste of that in this course by having software abstractions that you build upon on each assignment. So scoped array led to array list, and then we've used different variants of array list throughout the course. And so be aware that um, I'm trying to mimic the realities of, of real world life within the confines of, of a short four and a half week course. But in reality, thinking for the future and designing for the future is very important in real life. What's another problem with doing things like this with type tags and all this different kind of code? It means that you end up having to go to lots of places in your software to make any changes. You have to go through your functions and add new cases, add new uh, switch statements for your, your type tags. And that just becomes unwieldy. And it, it actually leads to something that is given the funny name, bad software smells. And so if you take a look at the link at the bottom of this page, you'll see that there's this whole concept of uh, certain features in languages being associated with poor, poorly designed and poorly implemented code. And, and the, the colloquial phrase is it, it smells bad. You go to look at the code and like, oh, PU, that code, it smells bad. So switch statements are an example of what's called a bad software smell. And you can read more about this in the link below. It's it's a bit whimsical, but I think it gets the point across. It's like, uh, you know, rotten vegetables or sour milk or uh, rotten eggs. So what are we going to do instead? Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to model our expression tree as a recursive collection of nodes. And these nodes will be structured into a hierarchy that captures the properties of each node. So for example, the leaf nodes in our hierarchy contain no children. Unlike the example we saw before where we tightly packed all the different types of nodes into one canonical data structure, which is bad, it smells bad, believe me. Um, so leaf nodes will have no children. Unary nodes will only have one child, and you guessed it, binary nodes are gonna have two children. So once we have this revised structure where we have these different types of nodes, we're then going to design the interfaces in such a way that we can avoid distinguishing between a node with one element, like a leaf node, versus nodes with more than one element, like a unary node or a binary node or a ternary node, to avoid special cases in our software. And so that way, when we don't need to care, when we don't need to know or care how many nodes there are or how many pieces there are in a given node, we can treat them in a very uniform way. Now, this may not be apparently obvious right at the moment, but as we go through these examples, you'll see over and over again how we're able to treat these nodes in a canonical uniform way for great advantage by applying other patterns like iterator and visitor. But that gets us a little ahead of ourselves. Let's just focus on composite now. So this is what things look like with our inner, our, our uh, composite structure. So we're going to define a class called component node, which defines an API. And this is the set of methods in the API. And this is essentially um, really an abstract class. So we can think of it as sort of equivalent to a Java interface. 
And we're going to have four methods in our component node interface or API. It's going to have an item method that returns the value of a node if it's a leaf node or the type of the operator if it's an interior node, like a binary node or a unary node. We're going to have two methods called left and right that are going to return a pointer to the left child if it's a unary node uh, and a pointer to the right child if it's a binary node. And so you'll, you'll see how those things play out as we get a little further along. And then we also have a method called accept. And accept is used for the visitor pattern that we'll talk about later. So as you'll see, these methods are used to access various fields or data members. And in some implementations, they're no ops. So for example, for a leaf node, there is no left child. There is no right child. So those things will just return null and everything will be fine. The accept method is a very interesting method. We won't dwell on it at the moment, but it plays a very essential role in some upcoming patterns, namely the iterator and visitor pattern. And we use this method in order to be able to add or provide a hook to add arbitrary operations to our expression tree. And this is that whole wonderful idea of being able to make changes and add capabilities without breaking what's already there, which is really awesome. Uh, we'll come back and talk about these patterns in more detail shortly. So if you recall, I talked at length earlier about this concept of commonality and variability, where commonality is the API that's, or the interface that's designed to be stable. And so in this case, we have a common API item left, right, and accept. Variability comes from being able to subclass this abstract base class and then fill in implementations of these various methods. And that's the wonderful aspect of commonality and variability that we'll talk about over and over again throughout these slides. So we try to come up with a common interface that's fixed, and then we make it possible to customize that interface to support different variabilities. And in this context, a variability would be different kinds of nodes, like a binary add node or a unary negate node or a leaf node. Those are examples of variabilities. This is what our hierarchy is going to look like. And we'll talk about this in more detail as we get into the pattern. Note the inherent recursion in this hierarchy. So as you can see, a component node, which is the abstract base class or the interface, is the root of this inheritance hierarchy. Then we have various subclasses of component node. We have leaf node, and you can see leaf node is, is a leaf. It's at the edge of the tree. It has no other capabilities. Then we also have composite unary node, and composite unary node contains one instance of a component node. Composite binary node inherits from composite unary node, so it has the ability to have one child, and then it adds another child. So now it's got two children. And then from composite unary node and composite binary node, we have a whole bunch of other composite nodes. So for composite unary node, we have something called composite negate node, which is used to represent unary minus. And then for composite binary node, we have composite add node, composite subtract node, composite multiply node, and composite divide node. And these are all different variants that do the obvious things, right? Add, subtract, multiply, divide, and so on. So leaf node is a component node. Composite unary node is a component node and has a component node. And composite binary node is a component unary node and also has a component node. Now, this is one way of doing the representation. You could also do it slightly differently and have composite binary node inherit from component node, and then simply have two children directly. So as you'll see, it doesn't really matter whether we do it this way or this way. When we combine yet other patterns like bridge, it's going to allow us to have it even more flexible and even more abstracted. So you don't know or care how the composite hierarchy is structured, which is very cool. 